1984. Part 1. Chapter 6. Winston was writing in his diary. It was three years ago. It was on a dark evening, in a narrow side street near one of the big railway stations. She was standing near a doorway in the wall under a street lamp that hardly gave any light. She had a young face, painted very thick. It was really the paint that appealed to me, the whiteness of it, like a mask, and the bright red lips. Party women never paint their faces. There was nobody else in the street, and no telescreens. She said two dollars. I... For the moment it was too difficult to go on. He shut his eyes and pressed his fingers against them, trying to squeeze out the vision that kept recurring. He had an almost overwhelming temptation to shout a string of filthy words at the top of his voice, or to bang his head against the wall, to kick over the table and hurl the ink pot through the window, to do any violent or noisy or painful thing that might black out the memory that was tormenting him. Your worst enemy, he reflected, was your own nervous system. At any moment, the tension inside you was liable to translate itself into some visible symptom. He thought of a man whom he had passed in the street a few years back, a quite ordinary-looking man, a party member, aged 35 or 40, tallish and thin, carrying a briefcase. They were a few metres apart, when the left side of the man's face was suddenly contorted by a sort of spasm. It happened again just as they were passing one another. It was only a twitch, a quiver, rapid as the clicking of a camera shutter, but obviously habitual. He remembered thinking at the time, that poor devil is done for. And what was frightening was that the action was quite possibly unconscious. The most deadly danger of all was talking in your sleep. There was no way of guarding against that, so far as he could see. He drew in his breath and went on writing. I went with her through the doorway and across a backyard into a basement kitchen. There was a bed against the wall and a lamp on the table turned down very low. She... His teeth were set on edge. He would have liked to spit. Simultaneously with the woman in the basement kitchen, he thought of Catherine, his wife. Winston was married, had been married, at any rate. Probably, he still was married. For, so far as he knew, his wife was not dead. He seemed to breathe again, the warm, stuffy odour of the basement kitchen, an odour compounded of bugs and dirty clothes and villainous cheap scent, but nevertheless alluring, because no woman of the party ever used scent, or could be imagined as doing so. Only the proles used scent. In his mind, the smell of it was inextricably mixed up with fornication. When he had gone with that woman, it had been his first lapse in two years or thereabouts. Consorting with prostitutes was forbidden, of course. But it was one of those rules that you could occasionally nerve yourself to break. It was dangerous, but it was not a life and death matter. To be caught with a prostitute might mean five years in a forced labour camp. Not more. If you had committed no other offence... And it was easy enough, provided that you could avoid being caught in the act. The poorer quarters swarmed with women who were ready to sell themselves. Some could even be purchased for a bottle of gin, which the proles were not supposed to drink. Tacitly, the party was even inclined to encourage prostitution as an outlet for instincts which could not be altogether suppressed. Mere debauchery did not matter very much, so long as it was furtive and joyless, and only involved the women of a submerged and despised class. 
the unforgivable crime was promiscuity between party members. But, though this was one of the crimes that the accused in the Great Purges invariably confessed to, it was difficult to imagine any such thing actually happening. The aim of the party was not merely to prevent men and women from forming loyalties which it might not be able to control. Its real, undeclared purpose was to remove all pleasure from the sexual act. Not love, so much as eroticism, was the enemy, inside marriage as well as outside it. All marriages between party members had to be approved by a committee appointed for the purpose, and, though the principle was never clearly stated, permission was always refused if the couple concerned gave the impression of being physically attracted to one another. The only recognised purpose of marriage was to beget children for the service of the party. Sexual intercourse was to be looked on as a slightly disgusting minor operation, like having an enema. This again was never put into plain words, but in an indirect way it was rubbed into every party member from childhood onwards. There were even organisations such as the Junior Anti-Sex League, which advocated complete celibacy for both sexes. All children were to be begotten by artificial insemination, art-sem, as it was called in Newspeak, and brought up in public institutions. This, Winston was aware, was not meant altogether seriously, but somehow it fitted in with the general ideology of the party. The party was trying to kill the sex instinct, or, if it could not be killed, than to distort it and dirty it. He did not know why this was so, but it seemed natural that it should be so. And so far as the women were concerned, the party's efforts were largely successful. He thought again of Catherine. It must be nine, ten, nearly eleven years since they had parted. It was curious how seldom he thought of her, for days at a time he was capable of forgetting that he had ever been married. They had only been together for about fifteen months. The party did not permit divorce, but it rather encouraged separation in cases where there were no children. Catherine was a tall, fair-haired girl, very straight, with splendid movements. She had a bold, aquiline face. A face that one might have called noble until one discovered that there was as nearly as possible nothing behind it. Very early in their married life, he had decided, though perhaps it was only that he knew her more intimately than he knew most people, that she had without exception the most stupid, vulgar, empty mind that he had ever encountered. She had not a thought in her head that was not a slogan, and there was no imbecility, absolutely none, that she was not capable of swallowing if the party handed it out to her. The human soundtrack, he nicknamed her in his own mind. Yet he could have endured living with her if it had not been for just one thing, sex. As soon as he touched her, she seemed to wince and stiffen. To embrace her was like embracing a jointed wooden image. And what was strange was that even when she was clasping him against her, he had the feeling that she was simultaneously pushing him away with all her strength. The rigidity of her muscles managed to convey that impression. She would lie there with shut eyes, neither resisting nor cooperating, but submitting. It was extraordinarily embarrassing, and, after a while, horrible. But even then, he could have borne living with her if it had been agreed that they should remain celibate. But curiously enough, it was Catherine who refused this. They must, she said, produce a child if they could. 
so the performance continued to happen, once a week quite regularly, whenever it was not impossible. She used even to remind him of it in the morning, as something which had to be done that evening, and which must not be forgotten. She had two names for it. One was making a baby. The other was our duty to the party. Yes, she had actually used that phrase. Quite soon, he grew to have a feeling of positive dread when the appointed day came round. But luckily no child appeared, and in the end, she agreed to give up trying, and soon afterwards they parted. Winston sighed inaudibly. He picked up his pen again and wrote. She threw herself down on the bed, and at once, without any kind of preliminary, in the most coarse, horrible way you can imagine, pulled up her skirt. I... He saw himself standing there in the dim lamplight, with the smell of bugs and cheap scent in his nostrils, and in his heart a feeling of defeat and resentment, which even at that moment was mixed up in the thought of Catherine's white body, frozen forever by the hypnotic power of the party. Why did it have to always be like this? Why could he not have a woman of his own, instead of these filthy scuffles at intervals of years? But a real love affair was an almost unthinkable event. The women of the party were all alike. Chastity was as deeply ingrained in them as party loyalty. By careful, early conditioning, by games and cold water, by the rubbish that was dinned into them at school, and in the spies and in the youth league, by lectures, parades, songs, slogans and martial music, the natural feeling had been driven out of them. His reason told him that there must be exceptions, but his heart did not believe it. They were all impregnable, as the party intended that they should be, and what he wanted, more even than to be loved, was to break down that wall of virtue, even if it were only once in his whole life. The sexual act, successfully performed, was rebellion. Desire was thought crime. Even to have awakened Catherine, if he could have achieved it, would have been like a seduction, although she was his wife. But the rest of the story had got to be written down. He wrote, I turned up the lamp when I saw her in the light. After the darkness, the feeble light of the paraffin lamp had seemed very bright. For the first time, he could see the woman properly. He had taken a step towards her, and then halted, full of lust and terror. He was painfully conscious of the risk he had taken in coming here. It was perfectly possible that the patrols would catch him on the way out. For that matter, they might be waiting outside the door at this moment. If he went away without even doing what he had come here to do, it had got to be written down. It had got to be confessed. What he had suddenly seen in the lamplight was that the woman was old. The paint was plastered so thick on her face that it looked as though it might crack like a cardboard mask. There were streaks of white in her hair. But the truly dreadful detail was that her mouth had fallen a little open, revealing nothing except a cavernous blackness. She had no teeth at all. He wrote hurriedly, in scrabbling handwriting. When I saw her in the light, she was quite an old woman, fifty years old at least. But I went ahead and did it just the same. He pressed his fingers against his eyelids again. He had written it down at last. But it made no difference. The therapy had not worked. The urge to shout filthy words at the top of his voice was as strong as ever.